Hello everyone, I'm Athena Negrescu and I'm today with my favorite psychotherapist <laughs> from the Institute. It's my last day here and I want to do an interview with Andy Roman. Andy, thank you for being here. Thank you. Don't leave. <laughs> we, I don't want, we want to you leave. to stay here. Please run away from home and stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Andy. I know that you have the second, um, the second book. It's um, what is the name of your second book? Get real, get well. The power of authenticity to heal. It's true. If that, if I get real, I get well. It's true that the authenticity heal. Y yes, definitely. I've seen. I've seen it over and over again. When people really get honest with themselves, they get honest with the people in their lives, and they finally get real with what they want, to say no to what they don't want, and to and to actually be authentic. There's something relaxing about it. There's something exciting about it. But that's real energy. To hide things, that takes energy. But that's not good energy. That's the energy of illness and lying and, you know. But we are taught so many lies when we grow up. I mean, pick a topic and there's lies about it. We're, we're lied to about food, that you, we need animal protein, but, you know, you have to have milk. I grew up where, you know, they said, ah, before you go out to play, you have to drink your glass of milk. More than 33% of people are allergic to milk. So how can that be an important food? It's not food. It's food for baby cows. So that's just one lie. And then the lie about, the lie about who we are and what we deserve, those are the deeper lies. The truth shall set you free. And, you know, we're, we have to make our effort to, to find the truth about ourselves and to claim it. And we help each other here. That's a big part of it. You've been to the healing circle. Yes. It's, uh, there's a lot of crying in the circle. There's a lot of laughing. There's a lot of laughing and crying at the same time <laughs> sometimes. Because we're human. We feel deeply. And to think that we're uh, we're just robots, you know, that's a lie. It's not just not true. Yes. Why we lie? We lie when the truth is uncomfortable, or the truth is not accepted. We learn to, uh, if you're going, if school was like for you, like it was for me, we're taught, you know, to be quiet, listen. Just say back to the teacher what they say to you. I learned the system really well. I was a very good student in school. And I learned. One day, this is a funny story. When I was a little boy, I had seen a show on television about robots. And so I was pretending to be a robot while I was watching the teacher. And I was just, I didn't hear anything she said. And I was just pretending. I would take my pencil and write like a robot. At the end of the class, she said, I want you to notice how what a good student Andy is. And then I had it all figured out. If I want to do well in school, be a robot. Yeah. And so, but the good news is I, I finally woke up from that. You know, I'm not a robot. What about our secret that we have, the secret that we have? And don't tell nobody. There is a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous. That goes like this, you are as sick as your secrets. And there is something about that that's accurate. That's why in Alcoholics Anonymous, people get together and they confess. They confess their sins or whatever. And then everybody is supportive and then people feel better. Even the Catholic Church, confession is a, is a big thing. And, you know, people... You go into this little box with the priest. You don't look at each other. And you say something and they say, okay, all right, don't sin anymore. 
And then people go out and they say, okay, I have a whole new week of sinning I can do. So, but confession is, um, is, a, is a good thing because we are as sick as our secrets. So if I don't have any secrets, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't have to use energy to hide things. And that energy will just be there for, for playing, for enjoying. You know, the, the wonderful thing for me, I work as a therapist, a psychotherapist. People pay me to help them be honest with themselves. And so I get to say things that, that many people are uncomfortable with at first. And so I get a lot of practice in speaking the truth. Um, because my spirit is right. I'm there to help the person. I'm not there to make them feel bad. But uh, I worked with somebody a little earlier today that was born with uh, a strange hands. She was born deformed because her mother took some drugs or something. And she was, I didn't even notice, to be honest, I didn't even notice until she showed me that her fingers were short or something. And I said, oh, you have really cute little fingers or something. <laughs> I don't think anybody has ever called them cute. She's never heard anybody say anything positive about it. And she was ashamed. She was hiding. I might never have noticed she was so good in hiding it. And I figured once she told me, she trusted me enough to show me. And she showed me her shame and her, you know, all that. Then it was like, good for you. I'm happy for you that you can feel free to be honest with me. And honestly, I didn't think her hand was that weird. You know, it's different, but so what? What is the first step? If I want to be, to get real, what is the first step? What I can do? Are you sure you want the answer to <laughs> yes. this? You sure? Yes. You have to start telling the truth. the truth. Only the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I <laughs> know oh, that's what you say in court, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that means, that doesn't mean you blurt the truth. You just say, you know, hey, you're fat. You know, you don't, you don't have to be mean about it. Yes. But appropriately speaking the truth. That's just the right way to live. Otherwise, I know that when I don't tell the truth, I find myself having to work really hard to keep the lies consistent. And it's too much work. I'm too lazy for that. And and I'm I'm learning that um, I'm learning to live with the truth. That the truth is a good thing. I want to have a good relationship with the truth. There's an old saying: if you're not if you're not keeping company with the truth, who are you keeping company with? Meaning, you know, you would hang out with bad people. You would hang out with bad influences. You know, the truth is a good thing. Yes. But you know who, historically, who do we punish? Who do we put in jail? Who do we, you know, we put Nelson Mandela in jail. We put Jesus in jail. Put Martin Luther King in jail, Mahatma Gandhi. These were all people that were taking a stand for a higher truth. And we don't like that, people. We don't like the truth. We, we, who do we elect to be our presidents and to be our rulers? Liars. Yes. We're used to lies and we're addicted to lies. So it does take effort. And it takes good company to be with people who value the truth. You know, I've also seen, and I know this personally, if I want people to like me, I've noticed I, I try to figure out what they like, and then I will be that so that they will like me. But think about it. How will I know if they really like me if I'm just being what they like? I have to be true to myself, and then I will know who likes me. Right? Yes. But I have to be prepared to have some people not like me. And if I'm willing to do that, then I will find my real friends. And that's, that's just the way it works. Okay. I want to have a good relationship with the true, and I want to have a good relationship with the food. 
how I can do this. A good relationship with food? Mm -hmm. You sure? You, we're opening yes. up a big topic. Yes. Okay, good. Relationship with food, more important than what you eat and changing what you eat to get healthy is changing your relationship with food. Um, and that, that means uh, the, the quality, the quantity, when, uh, what kind of a mindset you want to be in when you're eating. These things are really, really important. A person's relationship with food reflects their relationship with themselves. If you have a bad relationship with food, it's because you're not really loving or caring for yourself. Once you have a good relationship with yourself, you will automatically want to know what's good for you and only eat what's good for you. It's not, it's not rocket science. Here's the key to having good health. Are you ready? Yes. And those of you who are out there, you might want to get some paper and pencil to write this down. Ready? Yes. Do the things that are good for you. Stop doing the things that are bad for you. Okay. So you don't have to write that down because it's so simple. And so it's just a simple formula. And But why is it that people don't do what they know is good for them and they continue to do things that they know are not good for them. It's because they get something out of bad eating. It's a distraction. It's, it's easier to focus on, on breaking good rules with food than it is to actually face things that you don't feel good about. It's a smoke screen. It's, it's not more often than not. It's just a way to avoid actually looking at what, what's going on. Parts of you that you don't like, being in the wrong relationships, not getting what you deserve or asking for it. These are the things that make for a powerful person. And our relationship with food mirrors that. When we're unconscious about our own self, we are more likely to have an unconscious relationship with food. And an unconscious relationship with food includes several things. One is we use food to fill an emptiness. We relate to food as if it is love and we are loving ourselves by giving ourselves something that makes us feel good in the moment. Um, you know, that's, that's, not a, that's an unconscious relationship with food. Everybody needs to eat. I mean, I've heard about breatharians i've never met anybody who has done that and maybe that's true i don't know but everybody else that i've met including myself i need to eat i have fasted for a little while but eventually if i keep fasting i will you know <laughs> get skinny and die you know it's it's just it's built in we need food um there are other basics that we need we need love. We need love. That might sound like a hippie statement or something spiritual or woo-woo, but it's biologically true. They did an experiment with baby monkeys. This is not very nice, but they took these newborn baby monkeys away from their mother, and then they gave them a choice between two metal monkeys, okay? Not, not real monkeys. One of them um, had milk bottles in it. It was made out of hard metal, but it had food. The other fake monkey, Mama, had no milk on it, but it was soft. It was made out of towels or very soft material. Which monkey, which fake monkey do you think the baby monkeys chose? With, uh, which? Which one? Uh, they had a choice. The, was... the fake one. But which fake one? The one with the milk or the one that was soft to touch? The one that was soft to touch. Right. Because even for baby monkeys, loving and being touched is more important than food. And when we mix our relationship with love with our relationship with food or our need for love with the need for food, we get confused. 
Even baby monkeys aren't confused, is what I'm saying. They, they know, they instinctively go because they want the softness of the, you know, they want the touch of their mother, the love of their mother. More important than food. I have a question for, for one client of mine. She has um, she has cancer mm -hmm. and she don't like this food. She don't like to eat sprouts. And uh, she told me that it's in a conflict. He wants to eat that food, but he don't like it, but he wants to heal himself, but he don't like the food. All right, does she believe that eating clean raw food will help her? I think yes, maybe he has some doubts because sometimes I feel it like it's not. You know, part of a healthy relationship with food is enjoyment, right? I don't want to just eat things that taste bad. So that's true. Part of a healthy relationship is enjoying it. But when it comes to medicine, it's not a requirement that you enjoy the food. If you know that it's good for you, you and you love yourself, you will do and choose what's good for you. Obviously, you know, if you want to help her, help her find good recipes that will that are, are enjoyable as well as nutritious and, and healthy. It's a stage. In the beginning, especially if your taste has been for other things, you have to re-educate your, your tongue. And the good news is that that's very possible. My taste has changed. I like the food. And, you know, to be honest, and no offense, Chef Ken, it's pretty much the same every week. <laughs> it's the same. I was going to say the same every day, but it's the same every week. But the, the reality is there's so many more good recipes, raw vegan. I mean, there's gourmet, tasty, yummy, raw vegan. But I, I don't even care. I do that on the weekends when I go to a vegan restaurant. I will, or when I make food at home. I yummy, tasty is important. But in the beginning, it doesn't even have to be tasty as long as I know I'm loving myself by doing it. And I have a, my taste has changed, even though it's the same. I look forward to it. When I'm in line getting my food, I'm drooling. <laughs> you know, not, not outside my, you know, just inside my mouth. <laughs> yes, I want to ask you about the addiction. So many people, they are uh, addicted to sugar. But they want to heal from the addiction and to eat a small, uh, to eat sugar, but not too yeah, much sugar. Right. And I cannot do this, and many people cannot do this. For me, it's better to not eat the sugar. And it's what do you think about this? If I am addicted to something, I can do a little. Listen. This is true for people that are addicted to alcohol. And some people say, well, I will just drink a little bit. And maybe some people can do that. Most addicts, most alcoholics have to go for zero. There's, an, there's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous. One drink is too many. A thousand are not enough. <laughs> and... You have to know and be realistic for yourself. If you can have a little bit of sugar and you don't get sick from it and you doesn't make you eat more, okay, God bless you. That's for you. You have to be honest about what kind of wiggle room you have. For many people, especially when you were talking about addictions, zero is the measure. That's where you go when it comes to the addictive substance. With alcohol, it's easy to go to zero because we don't need alcohol to live. With sugar, we don't need sugar to live. But food, we do need food. So that's why we have to be smart about what we eat. 
because we have to eat. And if you can't tolerate sugar, you know, I, I have had gout in the past. You know what gout mm -hmm. is? Gout is a high uric acid level mm -hmm. that shows up in the big toe. It's especially true for people that eat meat and drink beer. I don't eat meat. I don't drink beer. But I've still used to get gout as a vegan. And I finally confessed to Brian. I said, by the way, I have gout. Well, why? Why do I have gout? And he said it's rare for a vegan to have gout. But it might be because you don't metabolize fruit sugar properly. He said, stop eating fruit for a month and then measure your uric acid levels. And what do you know? He was right. <laughs> so I have zero wiggle room. I, I can't eat sugar. I can't eat fruit. And I'm motivated to stay with that because I don't want gout. Gout is painful. So there are some people they can eat fruit. Even Brian today, I heard him say, if you're healthy, you can have up to 15% organic tree ripened fruit. It's true that some people have addictive personality. <laughs> yes, some more than others. <laughs> yes, <more. laughs> I, I would pretty I, much say everybody has an addictive personality, but for some, it's it's really, it's it's visible, it's noteworthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the addiction? A, it, it's a very good question. Addiction. You have an addictive relationship with something when it serves two purposes. The first purpose is it helps you not feel pain. The second is it gives you pleasure. So if you have something that helps you not feel pain and gives you pleasure, bingo, you have a perfect addictive substance. Freud said we, we live by the pleasure principle, right? He said we do things because we're we're oriented to pleasure, but I don't think he was right. Stronger than the pleasure principle is the avoidance of pain principle. We do whatever we need to do to not feel pain. And so that's why pain is really a central part of how I do therapy. I hit people. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't inflict pain, but I help people get in touch with and feel their own pain. You've been to the healing circle? Yes, I always. And some people, oh, they're afraid to take their turn because Andy makes people cry. No, I make room for the tears that are really there. And then once, I mean, there was this, I forget when it was, this week or last week, somebody, they were in the depths of despair. They felt terrible. And, and I didn't say things to cheer them up. I helped them go deeper into it. And eventually, they themselves found they made some kind of a joke. They, they started laughing. And once they felt it, they stopped resisting the feeling. And then the feeling, feelings are going cycles. And if you give room to a feeling, it will just wait a while, be patient. It will, the opposite of it will come around. But when we fight certain feelings, we, we end up dragging them out. I want to get rid of this sad feeling. No, you can't get rid of feeling. That's not the proper approach. Feelings are part of us. And it's more important. My approach is have your feelings. Don't be had by them. When we fight our feelings, we're giving them the power over us. It just, it takes some practice. It, it just takes some practice. And then it's like, oh, okay. You know, you might think, oh, I'm a therapist. I've been in the field. I'm a mature person. You know, I cry. I cry almost every day. Yes. Yes. But you laugh almost every and day. And I, I laugh way more than I cried nowadays because I, I make room for all of it. How important is laughing? Oh, my God. Laughing is... Um, even babies laugh. <laughs> what are they laughing at? 
What are babies laughing at when they laugh? It's they, they don't even know language yet, right? You can go, <laughs> and it and it'll maybe it will make a baby laugh. There's some videos on YouTube. Have you seen it? Where uh, there's several of them. One where this this family has like four babies, like they're quadruplets, so they're all little babies, and the father is there, and they're all sitting up in their little chairs, and he'll go. And then they all start laughing. I watch that video regularly because it's so charming. And it's it's like the, the laughter of a baby is so clean. And it's not because he told them a joke or something. It's just because it's part of us. It's a really important. It's an important part of our being human. Yes. And if we don't let ourselves to feel the pain, maybe we have pain from the childhood yeah. and we didn't feel the pain. Why we don't want to feel the pain when we are child? Well, when we're children, pain has a much deeper effect on us than when we're adult people. And so we protect ourselves from the pain by not feeling it. and. There are good biological reasons sometimes to not feel pain. I worked with a family once. They brought their adopted little girl to me. She was about seven years old. And they had adopted her in Vietnam. And what the, and this little girl came to me. She had strong uh, attachment anxiety, separation anxiety. Whenever her adopted mother would leave the room, she would cry and scream and do all kinds of things. She was very anxious about being separated. What this little girl didn't know was that she was found. Are you ready? This is not a happy yes. story. Yes, yes, yes. She was found in a dumpster, a garbage dumpster. Mm. That means her biological mother gave birth to her and threw her away. And mm. somebody found her before she died. And so my my point is there, the, the anxiety of being not wanted. I mean, can you imagine how deep that is? That she has to hide that from herself or she would die. And so, I mean, I didn't tell her, you know, by the way, you're seven, you can handle this now. No, I didn't tell her. And the feeling that she was carrying leaked out anyway she was she couldn't stand being separated from her adoptive mother so this is going to be a thing for her to work out in her life at some point um, she will need to know because she already feels it it's not like she's completely unaware of it no it's there but it's not what i call an integrated feeling yet it's there, but it's it's leaking out. And she has to protect herself from it until she's old enough so that when she feels it, she won't die. And once she feels it without dying, it will move from the part of the brain where the where the present danger is into the past. And then that's what I call an integrated feeling. And it won't. It won't be this tsunami anymore. When her mother leaves the room, it'll just be, oh, and then she'll get busy and, you know, because it's, she'll, she can have faith that she'll see her mother again. Her mother's going to come back. Originally, the original trauma was her mother threw her away and was never going to come back. Who could feel that? Wow. That's intense. I mean, I'm picking a dramatic example. Yes. That's why we lie to ourselves, to protect ourselves from pain. And then if we can enroll a substance to make ourselves feel better, ooh, sweet, handy, <laughs> it's perfect. It helps us hide our pain. It helps us feel good. We have to unwind ourselves and un untie ourselves from all of those knots. And then inside, it's just a, a natural, happy, 
childlike being. That's who we are. What is the difference between true and the belief? A belief and the true. The fascinating thing about that question is that the body doesn't know the difference. The body does not know the difference between a belief and the truth. So even if I tell you philosophically what the difference is, a truth is true whether people believe it or not, and a belief may or may not be true. Those are some statements. But that doesn't matter to the body. If I believe it, it's true for me. The placebo response is a good example of how if I believe I'm getting the shot that is medicine, my body will respond as if I'm getting the medicine. Do you know how often a placebo works in the general population? Do you know how often fake medicine works? I uh, I heard some studies. Yes, I there are some studies. Yes, yes. But how they work? W one third of the time, that's how often it works. One third. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. I had a I had a friend whose wife was a cancer researcher. And she was telling me about some of the new medicines, the new drugs that are working really well. And I said, well, how effective are these new drugs? And she said, they're really good. They work about 35% of the time. And then she said, before, before I had a chance to say it, she said, oh, you know, the placebo response works 33% of the time. <laughs> how much of that working of the drug is the placebo response mm. which is and drug companies their job is to defeat the placebo response which kind of makes sense because if you tell somebody this medicine will help you our belief itself will make the medicine help us if i don't believe that this food it would help me okay oof Except I have also seen exceptions because beliefs aren't necessarily the truth. The body can't tell the difference. And there is a certain point where belief does play in and it can interfere with the good food helping. But I've seen people who hated the food. They're only here because their family forced them to come here. They don't believe it and they don't like it. But their lab numbers showed that this was helping them. Once they believed it, once they had proof and they believed it, then things got way better much faster. So belief is a funny thing because it, they're not believing it didn't stop it from helping them. But there were other times where I have seen beliefs actually stop this from helping. I've told you that famous story of the, the Vietnam veteran soldier who committed war crimes during the war and he said i don't deserve to get well and i'm convinced with a belief like that he could eat green and would not that he would not get well because he had this belief that he didn't deserve it once he worked through that he did get well N not just because he believed he deserved it but because the food helped him. He let the goodness of it all reach him. He deserved it. And he accepted it and received it. So beliefs are a funny thing. We, um, we tell uh, each other a story. I tell me a story. How we can change that story that we tell us? Um, most We can change the story? <laughs> Most stories that we tell ourselves are lies. <laughs> Even simple, you know, it seems like it would be true if I say, I am a therapist, I am a father, I am a male. You know, okay, yes, at some level that's true. But that's not, you know, there was a man, one of our medical directors years ago, used to be a, a surgeon. And so he identified with being a surgeon. I am a surgeon. But then he was in a car accident and injured his wrist, and he was no longer able to do surgery. Wow. So he's still a doctor, but he's not a surgeon. And 
you know, he he said that was really hard for him because he, the story he was telling himself was, I am a surgeon. I'm a famous surgeon. I'm a really good surgeon. And then he couldn't tell that story anymore. And he was depressed. Well, he was depressed because the the reality didn't match his story anymore. And that's why people come to therapy a lot. When the story that they're telling themselves just doesn't match the reality anymore. What about the identity? Many people, they they tell me, I am a uh, cancer. Uh, I have can No, I have cancer. I have, I am an individual with cancer. I am a cancer patient. They don't tell me the name. That's their yeah. identity. Right. Well, that's, uh, that's just as tricky as identifying with other things. That they have cancer might be true, but that that they identify themselves as that, like, uh, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. You know, people come to the healing circle, and some people are very sick here, and they, they, they've come to believe, oh, I'm sick, I have nothing to give, my life is over, it has no purpose, I'm, I'm a burden on my family. These are the lies, these are the stories. And then they come to the healing circle and it's somebody else's turn and they give brilliant feedback that's really helpful to the person. And then it's like they're challenging the story that they're telling themselves. I don't care if you're lying down and you can hardly lift your arm. You still are a human being and you have some wisdom, you know. And so that's that's helpful. That's being authentic. That's being true. That's how being authentic Helps a person get well. Oh, I still am myself. I still have uh, something to give. I can still be of help. I still have value. And how they can change the identity? Listen, I for myself, I've received and still receive a lot of help in in changing and realizing my identity. But honestly, I've been shown something. You know, we had that program by Prem Rawat, the peace education program. Yes. But he showed me how to go inside myself. He showed me some techniques. And when I go deep enough, I recognize, oh, that's who I really am. That's what I really am. And it turns out that what I really am is this incredible joy this incredible peace, this incredible clarity, that's my real identity. Yes. My last question. Okay. I know that you are vegan for how many years? I've been a vegan maybe 25 years now. Wow. Yeah. What is the reason that you are vegan? Well, I was vegetarian when I first started here 30 years ago. And it took me about five or six years to go vegan. And what really did it for me was I saw people get well. It's so compelling. It works. And so I said, all right, I'm going to do it. And so I gave up these things, you know, whatever it was. And I missed them and I cried for them. But then eventually I just started feeling better. And then my motivator is, I feel good. I f it feels right. And then the moral part of it, like not wanting to hurt animals. I don't wear leather. I don't buy leather. I don't have leather seats in my car. I just, I mean, I'm still wearing a silk tie. And I don't buy silk ties anymore because, you know, silkworms are animals. We're disrupting their natural happy life. They just want to. I don't know. They're not happily making a tie for me. <laughs> so I find that the moral part of it is that's that's helpful to me. And when I look at the food industry, the the cattle industry, the poultry industry, there's so much cruelty. It's so unnecessary that that reinforces for me that being vegan is the right way to live. It's important for my health. It's important for the planet. It's important for humanity. You know, even Mahatma Gandhi, 
once said, you can judge a society by how they treat their stray dogs. You can judge a culture by how they treat their stray dogs. Yeah. I think Mahatma Gandhi said that. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, yeah. Andy. Remember, run away from home. Come here. Yes. Live here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you.